Chapter Seventeen of the Money Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a Romance by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter Seventeen. How Bellew began the game. Now in this life of ours, there be games of many and divers sorts, and all are calculated to try the nerve, courage, or skill of the player, as the case may be. Bellew had played many kinds of games in his day, and, among others, had once been famous as a right tackle on the Harvard Eleven. Upon him he yet bore certain scars received upon a memorable day when Yale, flushed with success, saw their hitherto invincible line rent and burst asunder, saw a figure torn, bruised, and bleeding, flash out and away down the field to turn defeat into victory, and then to be borne off honorably to hospital and bed. If Bellew thought of this, by any chance, as he sat there, staring up at the moon, it is very sure that, had the choice been given him, he would joyfully have chosen the game of torn flesh and broken bones, or any other game, no matter how desperate, rather than this particular game that Adam had invented and thrust upon him. Presently Bellew knocked the ashes from his pipe, and rising, walked on slowly toward the house. As he approached, he heard someone playing the piano and the music accorded well with his mood, or his mood with the music, for it was haunting, and very sweet, and with a recurring melody in a minor key, that seemed to voice all the sorrow of humanity past, present, and to come. Drawn by the music, he crossed the rose-garden, and, reaching the terrace, paused there, for the long French windows were open, and from where he stood he could see Anthea seated at the piano, she was dressed in a white gown of some soft, clinging material, and among the heavy braids of her hair was a single great red rose. And, as he watched, he thought she had never looked more beautiful than now, with the soft glow of the candles upon her, for her face reflected the tender sadness of the music. It was in the mournful droop of her scarlet lips, and the sombre depths of her eyes. Close beside her sat little Miss Priscilla, busy with her needle as usual. But now she paused, and, lifting her head in her quick, bird-like way, looked up at Anthea long and fixedly. "'Anthea, my dear,' she said suddenly, "'I'm fond of music, and I love to hear you play, as you know. But I never heard you play quite so dofully. Oh, dear me, no, that's not the right word, nor dismal, but I mean something between the two. I thought you were fond of Grieg, Aunt Priscilla. So I am, but then, even in his gayest moments, poor Mr. Grieg was always breaking his heart over something or other, and— oh, Gracious! There's Mr. Bellew at the window. Oh, pray come in, Mr. Bellew, and tell us how you liked Peter Day and the muffins. Thank you, said Bellew, stepping in through the long French window. But I should like to hear Miss Anthea play again, first, if she will. But Anthea, who had already risen from the piano, shook her head. "'I only play when I feel like it, to please myself and Aunt Priscilla,' said she, crossing to the broad, low window-seat, and leaning out into the fragrant night. "'Why, then,' said Bellew, seeking into the easy chair that Miss Priscilla indicated with a little stab of her needle, "'why, then, the muffins were delicious, Aunt Priscilla, and Peter Day was just exactly what a one-legged mariner ought to be.' "'And the shrimps, Mr. Bellew?' inquired Miss Priscilla, busy at her sewing again. "'Out shrimped all other shrimps soever,' he answered, glancing to where Anthea sat with her chin, propped in her hand, gazing up at the waning moon, seemingly quite oblivious of him. "'And did he pour out the tea?' inquired Miss Priscilla. "'From the china pot with the blue flowers and the Chinese mandarin fanning himself?' and very awkward of course with his one hand i don't mean the mandarin mr bellew and very full of apologies he did just as usual yes he always does and every year he gives me three lumps of sugar and i only take one you know it's a pity sighed miss priscilla that it was his right arm a great pity and here she sighed again and catching herself glanced up quickly at bellew and smiled to see how completely absorbed he was in contemplation of the silent figure in the window-seat. 
"'But, after all, better a right arm than a leg,' she pursued. "'At least I think so.' "'Certainly,' murmured Bellew. "'A man with only one leg, you see, would be almost as helpless as an old woman with a crippled foot.' "'Who grows younger and brighter every year,' added Bellew, turning to her with his pleasant smile. "'Yes, and I think prettier.' "'Oh, Mr. Bellew!' exclaimed Miss Priscilla, shaking her head at him reprovingly, yet looking pleased none the less. "'How can you be so ridiculous, good gracious me!' "'Why, it was the sergeant who put it into my head.' "'The sergeant?' "'Yes. It was after I had given him your message about peaches, Aunt Priscilla, and—' "'Oh, dear heart!' exclaimed Miss Priscilla at this juncture. "'Prudence is out to-night, and I promise to bake the bread for her, "'and here I sit chatting and gossiping "'while that bread goes rising and rising all over the kitchen.' "'And Miss Priscilla laid aside her sewing, "'and, catching up her stick, hurried to the door. "'And I was almost forgetting to wish you "'many happy returns of the day, Aunt Priscilla,' said Bellew, rising. "'At this familiar appellation, Anthea turned sharply, "'in time to see him stoop, and kiss Miss Priscilla's small white hand, whereupon Anthea must needs curl her lip at his broad back. Then he opened the door, and Miss Priscilla tapped away, even more quickly than usual. Anthea was half sitting, half kneeling among the cushions in the corner of the deep window, apparently still lost in contemplation of the moon, so much so that she did not stir, or even lower her upward gaze, when Bellew came and stood beside her. Therefore, taking advantage of the fixity of her regard, he once more became absorbed in her loveliness. Surely a most unwise proceeding, in Arcadia by the light of a midsummer moon, and he mentally contrasted the dark, proud beauty of her face with that of all the women he had ever known, to their utter and complete disparagement. "'Well,' inquired Anthea, at last perfectly conscious of his look, and finding the silence growing irksome, yet still with her eyes averted. "'Well, Mr. Bellew?' "'On the contrary,' he answered, "'the moon is on the wane.' "'The moon?' she repeated. "'Suppose it is. What then?' "'True happiness can only come riding astride the full moon, you know. You remember old Nanny told us so.' "'And you believed it?' she inquired scornfully. "'Why, of course,' he answered in his quiet way. Anthea didn't speak, but once again the curl of her lip was eloquent. "'And so,' he went on, quite unabashed, "'when I behold happiness riding astride the full moon, "'I shall just reach up in the most natural manner in the world, "'and take it down, that it may abide with me world without end. "'Do you think you will be tall enough?' "'We shall see, when the time comes.' "'I think it's all very ridiculous,' said Anthea. "'Why, then, suppose you play for me, "'that same plaintive piece you were playing as I came in. "'Something of Grieg's, I think it was. "'Will you, Miss Anthea?' "'She was on the point of refusing. "'Then, as if moved by some capricious whim, "'she crossed to the piano "'and dashed into the riotous music of a Polish dance. "'As the wild notes leapt beneath her quick brown fingers, "'Bellew, seated nearby, kept his eyes upon the great red rose in her hair, that nodded slyly at him with her every movement. And surely, in all the world, there had never bloomed a more tantalizing, more wantingly provoking rose than this. Wherefore, Bellew, very wisely, turned his eyes from its glowing temptation. Doubtless observing which, the rose, in evident desperation, nodded and swayed until— it had fairly nodded itself from its sweet resting-place, and, falling to the floor, lay within Bellew's reach, whereupon he promptly stooped and picked it up, and, even as with a last crashing chord Anthea ceased playing, and turned, in that same moment he dropped it deftly into his coat-pocket. "'Oh, by the way, Mr. Bellew,' she said, speaking as if the idea had but just entered her mind, "'What do you intend to do about all your furniture?' "'Do about it?' he repeated, settling the rose carefully in a corner of his pocket, where it would not be crushed by his pipe. "'I mean, where would you like it, stored, until you can send and have it taken away?' "'Well, I, er, uh, 
rather thought of keeping it where it was if you didn't mind i'm afraid it will be impossible mr bellew why then the barn will be an excellent place for it i i don't suppose the rats and mice will do it any real harm and as for the damp and the dust oh you know what i mean exclaimed anthea beginning to tap the floor impatiently with her foot of course we can't go on using the things now that they are your property it wouldn't be right very well he nodded his fingers questing anxiously after the rose again i'll get adam to help me to shift it all into the barn to-morrow morning will you please be serious mr bellew as an owl he nodded why then of course you will be leaving dapplemere soon and i should like to know exactly when so that i can make the necessary arrangements but you see i am not leaving dapplemere soon or even thinking of it not she repeated glancing up at him in swift surprise not until you bid me i you but i i understood that you intend to settle down but certainly nodded bellew transferring his pipe to another pocket altogether lest it should damage the rose's tender petals to settle down has lately become the um, ambition of my life then pray said anthea taking up a sheet of music and beginning to study it with attentive eyes be so good as to tell me what you mean that necessarily brings us back to the moon again answered bellew the moon the moon but what in the world has the moon to do with your furniture she demanded her foot beginning to tap again everything i bought that furniture with the with one eye on the moon as it were consequently the furniture the moon and i are bound indissolubly together you are pleased to talk in riddles to-night and really mr bellew i have no time to waste over them so if you will excuse me thank you for playing to me he said as he held the door open for her i played because i i felt like it mr bellew nevertheless i thank you when you make up your mind about the furniture please let me know when the moon is at the full yes can it be possible that you are still harping on the wild words of poor old nanny she exclaimed and once more she curled her lip at him nanny is very old i'll admit he nodded but surely you remember that we proved her right in one particular i mean about the tiger mark you know now when he said this for no apparent reason the eyes that had hitherto been looking into his proud and scornful wavered and were hidden under their long thick lashes the colour flamed in her cheeks and without another word she was gone end of chapter seventeen teen of the money moon this librivox recording is in the public domain the Money Moon, A Romance, by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 18. How the Sergeant Went Upon His Guard. The Arcadians, one and all, generally follow that excellent maxim which runs, Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy and wealthy and wise. Healthy they are, beyond a doubt, and, in their quaint, simple fashion, profoundly wise. If they are not extraordinarily wealthy, yet are they generally blessed with contented minds which, after all, is better than money and far more to be desired than fine gold. Now whether their general health, happiness, and wisdom is to be attributed altogether to their early-to-bed proclivities is perhaps a moot question. Howbeit, to-night, long after these weary Arcadians had forgotten their various cares and troubles in the blessed oblivion of sleep, for even Arcadia has its troubles, Bellew sat beneath the shade of King Arthur alone with his thoughts. Presently, however, he was surprised to hear the house-door open, and close very softly, and to behold, not the object of his meditations, but Miss Priscilla coming towards him. As she caught sight of him in the shadow of the tree, she stopped and stood, leaning upon her stick as though she were rather disconcerted. "'Aunt Priscilla,' said he, rising. "'Oh, it's you!' 
she exclaimed, just as though she hadn't known it all along. "'Dear me, Mr. Bellew, how lonely you look, and dreadfully thoughtful! Good gracious!' And she glanced up at him with her quick, girlish smile. "'I suppose you are wondering what I am doing out here at this unhallowed time of night. It must be nearly eleven o'clock. Oh, dear me, yes, you are. Well, sit down, and I'll tell you. Let us sit here, in the darkest corner. There. Oh, dear heart, how bright the moon is, to be sure!' So saying, Miss Priscilla ensconced herself at the very end of the rustic bench, where the deepest shadow lay. "'Well, Mr. Bellew,' she began, "'as you know, to-day is my birthday. As to my age, I am, let us say, just turned twenty-one, and, being young and foolish, Mr. Bellew, I have come out here to watch another very foolish person, a ridiculous old sergeant of hussars, who will come marching along very soon to mount guard in full regimentals, Mr. Bellew, with his busby on his head, and his braided tunic and dolman, and his great big boots, and with his spurs jingling, and his sabre bright under the moon. So then, you know he comes? Why, of course I do, and I love to hear the jingle of his spurs, and to watch the glitter of his sabre. So every year I come here, and sit among the shadows, where he can't see me, and watch him go, march, march, marching, up and down, and to and fro, until the clock strikes twelve, and he goes marching home again. Oh, dear me, it's all very foolish, of course, but I love to hear the jingle of his spurs. And have you sat here watching him every year? Every year! And has he never guessed you were watching him? Oh, good gracious me, of course not! Don't you think, Aunt Priscilla, that you are just a little cruel? Cruel? Why, what do you mean? I gave him your message, Aunt Priscilla. What message? That to-night the peaches were riper than ever they were? Oh, said Miss Priscilla, and waiting expectantly for Bellew to continue. But as he was silent, she glanced at him, and seeing him staring at the moon, she looked at it also and after she had gazed for perhaps half a minute, as Bellew was still silent, she spoke, though in a very small voice indeed. "'And what did he say?' "'Who?' inquired Bellew. "'Why, the, the sergeant, to be sure.' "'Well, he gave me to understand that a poor old soldier, with only one arm left, must be content to stand aside, always and—' hold his peace, just because he was a poor, maimed old soldier. Don't you think that you have been just a little cruel all these years, Aunt Priscilla? Sometimes one is cruel only to be kind, she answered. Aren't the peaches ripe enough after all, Aunt Priscilla? Overripe, she said bitterly. Oh, they are overripe. Is that all, Aunt Priscilla? No, she answered. No. "'There's this,' and she held up her little crutch-stick. "'Is that all, Aunt Priscilla?' "'Oh, isn't that enough?' Bella rose. "'Where are you going? What are you going to do?' she demanded. "'Wait,' said he, smiling down at her perplexity. And so he turned, and, crossing to a certain corner of the orchard, when he came back he held out a great glowing peach towards her. "'You were quite right,' he nodded. It was so ripe that it fell at a touch. But as he spoke, she drew him down beside her in the shadow. Hush! she whispered. Listen! Now, as they sat there, very silent, faint and far away upon the still night air, they heard a sound, a silvery, rhythmic sound it was, like the musical clash of fairy cymbals which drew rapidly nearer and nearer and Bellew felt that Miss Priscilla's hand was trembling upon his arm as she leaned forward, listening with a smile upon her parted lips, and a light in her eyes that was ineffably tender. Nearer came the sound, and nearer, until presently, now in moonlight, now in shadow, there strode a tall, martial figure in all the glory of braided tunic, and furred dolman, the three chevrons upon his sleeve, and many shining medals upon his breast. A stalwart, soldierly figure, despite the one empty sleeve, who moved with a long, swinging stride that only the cavalryman can possess. Being come beneath a certain latticed window, the sergeant halted, and, next moment, 
His glittering sabre flashed up to the salute. Then, with it upon his shoulder, he wheeled, and began to march up and down, his spurs jingling, his sabre gleaming, his dolman swinging, his sabre glittering each time he wheeled, while Miss Priscilla, leaning forward, watched him wide-eyed, and with hands tight clasped. Then, all at once, with a little fluttering sigh, she rose. Thus the sergeant, as he marched to and fro, was suddenly aware of one who stood in the full radiance of the moon, and with one hand outstretched towards him. And now, as he paused, disbelieving his very eyes, he saw that in her extended hand she held a great ripe peach. Sergeant, she said, speaking almost in a whisper, oh, sergeant, won't you take it? The heavy sabre thudded down into the grass, and he took a sudden step towards her. But even now he hesitated, until, coming nearer yet, he could look down into her eyes. Then he spoke, and his voice was very hoarse and uneven. "'Miss Priscilla,' he said. "'Priscilla?' "'Oh, Priscilla!' And with the word he had fallen on his knees at her feet, and his strong, solitary arm was folded close about her. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of the Money Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a Romance by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter Nineteen, in which Porges Big and Porges Small discuss the subject of matrimony. What is it, my Porges? Well, I'm a bit worried, you know. Worried? Yes, afraid I shall be an old man before my time, Uncle Porges. Adam says it's worry that ages a man, and it killed a cat, too. And why do you worry? Oh, it's my Auntie Anthea, a course. She was crying again last night. Crying? Bellew had been lying flat upon his back in the fragrant shadow of the hayrick, but now he sat up, very suddenly, so suddenly that small Porges started. Crying? he repeated last night. Are you sure? Oh, yes, you see, she forgot to come and talk me up last night, so I creeped downstairs, very quietly, you know, to see why, and I found her bending over the table, all sobbing and crying. At first she tried to pretend that she wasn't, but I saw the tears quite plain. Her cheeks were all wet, you know, and when I put my arms round her to comfort her a bit and asked her what was the matter, she only kissed me a lot and said, nothing, nothing, only a headache. And why was she crying, do you suppose, my Porges? Oh, money, of course, he sighed. What makes you think it was money? Cause she'd been talking to Adam. I heard him say good night as I creeped down the stairs. Ah, said Bellew, staring straight before him. His beloved pipe had slipped from his fingers, and, for a wonder, lay all neglected. It was after she had talked with Adam, was it, my Porges? Yes. That's why I knew it was about money. Adam's always talking about mortgages and bills and money. Oh, Uncle Porges, how I do hate money. It is sometimes a confounded nuisance, nodded Bellew. But I do wish we had some, so we could pay all her bills and mortgages for her. She'd be so happy, you know, and go about singing like she used to. And I shouldn't worry myself into an old man before my time, all wrinkled and gray, you know. And all would be revelry and joy if only she had enough gold and banknotes. And she was crying, you say, demanded Bellow again, his gaze still far away. Yes. You are quite sure you saw the tears, my Porges? Oh, yes. And there was one on her nose, too. A big one that shone awful bright, twinkled, you know. And she said it was only a headache, did she? Yes. But that meant money. Money always makes her headache lately. Oh, Uncle Porges, I suppose people do find fortunes sometimes, don't they? Why, yes, to be sure they do. <sighs> then I wish I knew where they looked for them, said he with a very big sigh indeed. I've hunted and hunted in all the attics and the cupboards and under hedges and in ditches and prayed and prayed, you know, every night. 
"'Then, of course, you'll be answered, my Porges. "'Do you really suppose I shall be answered? "'You see, it's such an awful long way for one small prayer to have to go, "'from here to heaven, and there's clouds that get in the way, "'and I'm afraid my prayers aren't quite big or heavy enough, "'and get lost and blown away in the wind.' "'No, my Porges said Bellew, drawing his arm about the small disconsolate figure. "'You may depend upon it that your prayers fly straight up into heaven, and that neither the clouds nor the wind can come between or blow them away. So just keep on praying, old chap, and when the time is ripe, they'll be answered, never fear.' "'Answered? Do you mean—oh, Uncle Porges, do you mean the money moon?' The small hand upon Bellew's arm quivered, and his voice trembled with eagerness. "'Why, yes, to be sure. The money moon, my gorgeous, it's bound to come, one of these fine nights.' "'Ah, but when, oh, when will the money moon ever come?' "'Well, I can't be quite sure, but I rather fancy, from the look of things, my gorgeous, that it will be pretty soon.' "'Oh, I do hope so, for her sake and my sake. You see—' She may go getting herself married to Mr. Cassilis, if something doesn't happen soon, and I shouldn't like that, you know. Neither should I, my Porges, but what makes you think so? Why, he's always bothering her, and asking her to, you see. She always says no, of course, but one of these fine days, I'm afraid she'll say yes, accidentally, you know. Heaven forbid, nephew. Does that mean you hope not? Indeed, yes. Then I say heaven forbid, too, cause I don't think she'd ever be happy in Mr. Cassilis's great big house, and I shouldn't either. Why, of course not. You never go about asking people to marry you, do you, Uncle Porges? Well, it could hardly be called a confirmed habit of mine. That's one of the things I like about you so. All the time you've been here you haven't asked my Auntie Anthea once, have you? No, my Porges, not yet. Oh! "'But you don't mean that you ever will? "'Would you be very grieved and angry if I did, some day soon, my Porges?' "'Well, I, I didn't think you were that kind of a man,' answered small Porges, sighing and shaking his head regretfully. "'I'm afraid I am, nephew. "'Do you really mean that you want to marry my Auntie Anthea?' "'I do.' "'As much as Mr. Cassilis does?' "'A great deal more, I think.' Small Porges sighed again, and shook his head very gravely indeed. "'Uncle Porges,' said he, "'I'm surprised at you. "'I rather feared you would be, nephew. "'It's all so awful silly, you know. "'Why do you want to marry her?' "'Because, like a prince in a fairy tale, "'I'm uh, rather anxious to live happily ever after.' "'Oh!' said small Porges, turning this over in his mind. I never thought of that. Marriage is a very important institution, you see, my Porges, especially in this case, because I can't possibly live happily ever after, unless I marry first. Now can I? No, I suppose not, small Porges admitted, albeit reluctantly, after he had pondered the matter a while with wrinkled brow. But why pick out my auntie anthea just because she happens to be your auntie anthea of course small porges sighed again oh, why then if she's got to be married some day so she can live happily ever after well i suppose you'd better take her uncle porges thank you old chap i mean to i'd rather you took her than mr cassilis and why there he is who Mr. Cassilis, and he's stopped, and he's twisting his moustache. Mr. Cassilis, who had been crossing the paddock, had indeed stopped, and was twisting his black moustache, as if he were hesitating between two courses. Finally he pushed open the gate, and, approaching Bellew, saluted him with that supercilious air which Miss Priscilla always declared she found so trying. "'Ah, Mr. Bellew, what might it be this morning?' the pitchfork, the scythe, or the plough, he inquired. Neither, sir, this morning it is matrimony. Eh? I beg your pardon, matrimony? 
"'With a very large M, sir,' nodded Bellew. "'Marriage, sir, wedlock. My nephew and I are discussing it in its aspects philosophical, sociological, and—' "'That is surely rather a peculiar subject to discuss with a child, Mr. Bellew.' "'Meaning my nephew, sir?' "'I mean young George there.' "'Precisely. My nephew, Small Porges.' "'I refer,' said Mr. Cassilis, with slow and crushing emphasis, "'to Miss Devine's nephew.' "'And mine, Mr. Cassilis, mine by their mutual adoption and inclination.' "'And I repeat that your choice of subjects is peculiar, to say the least of it.' "'But then mine is rather a peculiar nephew, sir. "'But surely it was not to discuss nephews, mine or anyone else's, "'that you are hither come, and our ears do wait upon you. "'Pray be seated, sir. "'Thank you. I prefer to stand.' "'Strange,' murmured Bellew, shaking his head. "'I never stand if I can sit, or sit if I can lie down.' "'I should like you to define exactly your position here at Dapplemere, Mr. Bellew.' Bellew's sleepy glance missed nothing of the other's challenging attitude, and his ear nothing of Mr. Cassilis's authoritative tone. Therefore his smile was most engaging as he answered, "'My position here, sir, is truly the most uh, enviable in the world. Prudence is an admirable cook.' particularly as regard Yorkshire pudding. Gentle little Miss Priscilla is the most, er, uh, aunt-like and perfect of housekeepers. And Miss Anthea is our sovereign lady, before whose radiant beauty small Porges and I are like true knights, and gallant gentles do constant homage, and in whose behalf small Porges and I do stand prepared to wage stern battle, by day or by night. Indeed, said Mr. Cassilis, and his smile was even more supercilious than usual. "'Yes, sir,' nodded Bellew, "'I do confess me a most fortunate and happy wight, who, having wandered hither and yon upon this planet of ours, which is so vast and so very small, has by the most happy chance found his way hither into Arcady. "'And may I inquire how long you intend to lead this Arcadian existence?' "'I fear I cannot answer that question until the full of the moon, sir. "'At present, I grieve to say, I do not know.' "'Mr. Cassilis struck his riding-boot a sudden smart rap with his whip. "'His eyes snapped, and his nostrils dilated as he glanced down into Bellew's imperturbable face. "'At least you know, and will perhaps explain, what prompted you to buy all that furniture. "'You were the only buyer at the sale, I understand.' "'Who bought anything? <laughs> yes,' nodded Bellew. "'And pray, what was your object, you, a stranger?' "'Well,' replied Bellew slowly, as he began to fill his pipe, "'I bought it because it was there to buy, you know. "'I bought it because furniture is apt to be rather useful now and then. "'I acquired the chairs to uh, sit in, the tables to a... Uh, "'Put things on, and—' "'Don't quibble with me, Mr. Bellew!' "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Cassilis. "'When I ask a question, sir, I am in the habit of receiving a direct reply. "'And when I am asked a question, Mr. Cassilis, "'I am in the habit of answering it precisely as I please, or not at all. "'Mr. Bellew, let me impress upon you, once and for all, "'that Miss Devine has friends.' old and tried friends to whom she can always turn for aid in any financial difficulty she may have to encounter friends who can more than tide over all her difficulties without the uh, interference of strangers and as one of her oldest friends i demand to know by what right you force your wholly unnecessary assistance upon her my very good sir returned bellew shaking his head in gentle reproof really you seem to forget that you are not addressing one of your grooms or footmen. Consequently, you force me to remind you of the fact. Furthermore, that is no answer, said Mr. Cassilis, his gloved hands tight clenched upon his hunting crop, his whole attitude one of menace. Furthermore, pursued Bellew placidly, settling the tobacco in his pipe with his thumb, you can continue to, er, uh, demand until all's blue. 
that I should continue to lie here and smoke and gaze up at the smiling serenity of heaven. The black brows of Mr. Cassilis met in a sudden frown. He tossed his whip aside, and took a sudden quick stride towards the recumbent Bellew with so evident an intention that small Porges shrank instinctively further within the encircling arm. But at that psychic moment, very fortunately for all concerned, there came the sound of a quick light step, and Anthea stood between them. "'Mr. Cassilis! Mr. Bellew!' she exclaimed, her cheeks flushed, and her bosom heaving with the haste she had made. "'Pray, whatever does this mean?' Bellew rose to his feet, and, seeing Cassilis was silent, shook his head and smiled. "'Upon my word, I hardly know, Miss Anthea. Our friend Mr. Cassilis seems to have got himself all worked up over the, uh, sale, I fancy.' "'The furniture!' exclaimed Anthea, and stamped her foot with vexation. "'That wretched furniture! Of course you explained your object in buying it, Mr. Bellew?' "'Well, no, we hadn't got as far as that.' Now, when he had said this, Anthea's eyes flashed sudden scorn at him, and she curled her lip at him, and turned her back upon him. "'Mr. Bellew bought my furniture because he intends to set up housekeeping. He is to be married, soon, I believe.' "'When the moon is at the full,' nodded Bellew. "'Married!' exclaimed Mr. Cassilis, his frown vanishing as if by magic. "'Oh, indeed!' "'I am on my way to the hop-gardens, if you care to walk with me, Mr. Cassilis?' And with the words Anthea turned, and, as he watched them walk away together, Bellew noticed upon the face of Mr. Cassilis an expression very like triumph, and in his general air a suggestion of proprietorship that jarred upon him most unpleasantly. "'Why do you frown so, Uncle Porges?' "'I uh, was thinking, nephew.' "'Well, I'm thinking, too,' nodded Small Porges, his brows knitted portentously. And thus they sat, Big and Little Porges, frowning in unison at space for quite a while. "'Are you sure you never told my Auntie Anthea that you were going to marry her?' inquired Small Porges at last. "'Quite sure, comrade. Why?' "'Then how did she know you were going to marry her and settle down?' "'Marry her and settle down?' "'Yes, at the full of the moon, you know.' "'Why, really, I don't know, my Porges, unless she guessed it.' "'I expect she did. She's awful clever at guessing things. But do you know—' "'Well?' "'I'm thinking I don't just like the way she smiled at Mr. Cassilis. I never saw her look at him like that before, as if she were awful glad to see him, you know. So I don't think I'd wait till the full of the moon if I were you.' I think you'd better marry her this afternoon. That, said Bellew, clapping him on the shoulder, is a very admirable idea. I'll mention it to her on the first available opportunity, my Porges. But the opportunity did not come that day, nor the next, nor the next after that. For it seemed that with the approach of the hop-picking, Anthea had no thought or time for anything else. Wherefore, Bellew smoked many pipes, and, as the days wore on, possessed his soul in patience, which is a most excellent precept to follow, in all things but love. End of chapter 19《Of the Money Moon》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a Romance, by Geoffrey Farnell Chapter Twenty, which relates a most extraordinary conversation. In the days which now ensued, while Anthea was busied out of doors, and Miss Priscilla was busied indoors, and Small Porges was diligently occupied with his lessons, at such times Bellew would take his pipe and go to sit and smoke in company with the cavalier in the great picture above the carved chimney piece. A right jovial companion at all times was this cavalier, an optimist he, from the curling feather in his broad-brimmed beaver hat to the spurs at his heels. Handsome, gay, and debonair was he, with lips upcurving to a smile beneath his mustachio, and a quizzical light in his grey eyes, very like that in Bellew's own. 
Moreover, he wore the knowing, waggish air of one well versed in all the ways of the world, and mankind in general, and, what is infinitely more, of the sex feminine in particular. Experienced was he, beyond all doubt, in their pretty tricks and foibles, since he had ever been a diligent student of feminine capriciousness when the Merry Monarch ruled the land. Hence it became customary for Bellew to sit with him, and smoke, and take counsel of this Prue Chevalier upon the unfortunate turn of affairs, whereof ensued many remarkable conversations, of which the following was one. Bellew no sir emphatically i do not agree with you to be sure you may have had more experience than i in such affairs but then it was such a very long time ago the cavalier interrupting or seeming to bellew again i beg to differ from you women are not the same to-day as they ever were judging by what i have read of the ladies of your day and king charles's court at whitehall i should say not at least if they are, they act differently, and consequently must be, er, uh, wooed differently. The methods employed in your day would be wholly inadequate, and quite out of place in this. The Cavalier, shaking his head, and smirking, or seeming to. Bellew. Well, I'm willing to bet you anything you like that if you were to step down out of your frame, change your velvets and laces for trousers and coat, leave off your great peruke, and wear a derby hat instead of that picturesque floppy affair, and try your fortune with some twentieth-century damsel, your high-sounding gallantries and flattering phrases would fall singularly flat, and you would be promptly turned down, sir. The Cavalier tossing his love-locks, or seeming to. Bellew. The strong hand, you say? Hum! History tells us that William the Conqueror wooed his lady with a club, or a battle-axe, or something of the sort, and she consequently liked him the better for it, which was all very natural and proper, of course, in her case, seeing that hers was the day of battle-axes and things. But then, as I said before, sir, the times are sadly changed." women may still admire strength of body, and even, occasionally, of mind, but the theory of dog-woman and walnut-tree is quite obsolete. The Cavalier, frowning and shaking his head, or seeming to. Bellew. Ha! You don't believe me? Well, that is because you are obsolete, too. Yes, sir, as obsolete as your hat, or your boots, or your long rapier. Now, for instance, suppose I were to ask your advice in my own case. You know precisely how the matter stands at present, between Miss Anthea and myself. You also know Miss Anthea personally, since you have seen her much and often, and have watched her grow from childhood into, er, uh, glorious womanhood. I repeat, sir, glorious womanhood. Thus you ought to know and understand her far better than I for I do confess she is a constant source of bewilderment to me. Now, since you do know her so well, what course should you adopt, were you in my place? The Cavalier, smirking more knowingly than ever, or seeming to. Bellew. Preposterous! Quite absurd! And just what I might have expected. Carry her off, indeed. No, no, we are not living in your bad old glorious days, when a maid's no was generally taken to mean yes, or when a lover might swing his reluctant mistress up to his saddle-bow and ride off with her, leaving the world far behind. Today it is all changed, sadly changed. Your age was a wild age, a violent age, but in some respects perhaps a rather glorious age. Your advice is singularly characteristic and, of course, quite impossible, alas, carry her off, indeed. Hereupon Bellew sighed, and, turning away, lighted his pipe, which had gone out, and buried himself in the newspaper. End of chapter 20THE MONEY MOON, A ROMANCE, BY GEOFFREY FARNELL CHAPTER Twenty One, OF SHOES AND SHIPS AND SEALING-WAX, 
and the third finger of the left hand. So Bellew took up the paper. The house was very quiet, for Small Porges was deep in the vexatious rules of the multiplication table, and something he called Jogafrey. Anthea was out, as usual, and Miss Priscilla was busied with her numerous household duties. Thus the brooding silence was unbroken, save for the occasional murmur of a voice, the jingle of the housekeeping keys, and the quick, light tap-tap of Miss Priscilla's stick. Therefore Bellew read the paper, and let it be understood that he regarded the daily news-sheet as the last resource of the utterly bored. Now presently, as he glanced over the paper with a negative interest, his eye was attracted by a long paragraph beginning. At St. George's, Hanover Square, by the Right Reverend the Bishop of Sylvia Cecile Merchmond, to His Grace the Duke of Ryde, K.G., K.C.B. Below followed a full, true, and particular account of the ceremony which, it seemed, had been graced by royalty. George Bellew read it halfway through, and yawned, positively and actually yawned, and thereafter laughed. <laughs> and so I have been in Arcadia only three weeks. I have known Anthea only twenty-one days. A ridiculously short time, as time goes, in any other place but Arcadia, and yet sufficient to lay forever the, er, uh, haunting spectre of the might have been. Lord, what a preposterous ass I was! Baxter was quite right, utterly and completely right. Now, let us suppose that this paragraph had read, "'Today at St. George's, Hanover Square, Anthea Divine to—' Oh, "'No, no! Confound it!' And Bellew crumpled up the paper and tossed it into a distant corner. "'I wonder what Baxter would think of me now. Good old faithful John!' the haunting spectre of the might have been. What a preposterous ass! What a monumental idiot I was! Posterous ass isn't a very pretty word, Uncle Porges, or continental idiot, said a voice behind him, and, turning, he beheld small Porges, somewhat stained, and bespattered with ink, who shook a reproving head at him. True, nephew, he answered, but they are sometimes very apt, and in this instance particularly so. Small Porges drew near, and, seating himself upon the arm of Bellew's chair, looked at his adopted uncle, long and steadfastly. "'Uncle Porges,' said he at last, "'you never tell stories, do you? I mean, lies, you know?' "'Oh, indeed, I hope not, Porges. Why do you ask?' "'Well, cause my Auntie Anthea's afraid you do.' "'Is she? Hm. Why?' When she came to tuck me up last night, she sat down on my bed and talked to me a long time, and she sighed a lot, and said she was afraid I didn't care for her any more, which is awful silly, you know. <laughs> yes, of course, nodded Bellew. And then she asked me why I was so fond of you, and I said, cause you were my Uncle Porges that I found under a hedge. And then she got more angrier than ever, and she said she wished I'd left you under the hedge. Oh, did she, my Porges? Yes, she said she wished she'd never seen you, and she'd be awful glad when you'd gone away. So I told her you weren't ever going away, and that you were waiting for the money moon to come and bring us the fortune. And then she shook her head and said, Oh, my dear, you mustn't believe anything he says to you about the moon or anything else, cause he tells lies. And she said lies twice. Ah, and did she stamp her foot, Porges? "'Yes, I think she did. "'And then she said there wasn't such a thing as a money moon, "'and she told me you were going away very soon to get married, you know.' "'And what did you say?' "'Oh, I told her that I was going too. "'And then I thought she was going to cry, "'and she said, "'Oh, Georgie, I didn't think you'd leave me, even for him. "'So then I had to explain how we had arranged "'that she was going to marry you "'so that we could all live happily ever after. "'I mean, that it was all settled.' you know, and that you are going to speak to her on the first, uh, opportunity. And then she looked at me a long time, and asked me, was I sure you had said so? And then she got awful angry indeed, and said, how dare he? Oh, how dare he? So, of course, I told her you'd dare anything, even a dragon, 
"'cause you are so big and brave, you know. So then she went and stood at the window, and she was so angry she cried, and I nearly cried too. But at last she kissed me good night and said you were a man that never meant anything you said, and that I must never believe you any more, and that you were going away to marry a lady in London, and that she was very glad cause then we should all be happy again, she supposed. So she kissed me again and tucked me up and went away. But it was a long, long time before I could go to sleep, cause I kept on thinking and thinking, supposing there really wasn't any money moon after all. Supposing you were going to marry another lady in London. You see, it would be also frightfully awful, wouldn't it? Terribly, dreadfully awful, my Porges. But you never do tell lies, do you, Uncle Porges? No. And there is a money moon, isn't there? <laughs> Why, of course there is. And you are going to marry my Auntie Anthea in the full of the moon, aren't you? Yes, my Porges. Why, then, everything's all right again. So let's go and sit under the haystack and talk about ships. But why ships? inquired Bello, rising. Because I made up my mind this morning that I'd be a sailor when I grew up, a mariner, you know, like Peter Day, only I'd prefer to have both of my legs. You'd find it more convenient, perhaps. You know all about oceans and waves and billows, don't you, Uncle Porges? Well, I know a little. And are you ever seasick like a landlubber? I used to be, but I got over it. Was it a very big ship that you came over in? Oh, no, not so very big, but she's about as fast as anything in her class, and a corking sea-boat. What's her name? Her name? repeated Bellew. Well, she was called the... Uh, Sylvia. That's an awful pretty name for a ship. Hmm, so-so. But I have learned a prettier, and next time she puts out to sea, we'll change her name, eh, my Porges? We? Oui? cried Small Porges, looking up with eager eyes. Do you mean you take me to sea with you, and my Auntie Anthea, of course? You don't suppose I'd leave either of you behind if I could help it, do you? We'd all sail away together, wherever you wished. Do you mean said Small Porges, in a suddenly awed voice, that it is your ship, your very own? Oh, yes. But do you know, Uncle Porges, you don't look as though you had a ship for your very own somehow. Don't I? You see, a ship is such a very big thing for one man to have for his very own self. And has it got masts and funnels and anchors? Lots of them. Then please... Will you take me and Auntie Anthea sailing all over the oceans? Just so soon as she is ready to come. Then I think I'd like to go to Nova Zembla first. I found it on my geography today, and it sounds nice and far off, doesn't it? It does, shipmate, nodded Bellew. Oh, that's fine, exclaimed Small Porges rapturously. You shall be the captain, and I'll be the shipmate, and we'll say aye-aye to each other, like the real sailors do in books, shall we? Ay, ay, shipmate, nodded Bellow again. Then please, Uncle Por— <laughs> I mean, Captain, what shall we name our ship? I mean, the new name. Well, my Porges, I mean, of course, shipmate, I rather thought of calling her— Hello, why, here's the sergeant. Sure enough, there was Sergeant Appleby sitting under the shade of King Arthur, but who rose and stood at attention as they came up. Why, sergeant, how are you? said Bellew, gripping the veteran's hand. You are half an hour before your usual time to-day. Nothing wrong, I hope? Nothing wrong, Mr. Bellew, sir. I thank you. No, nothing wrong, but this uh, is a memorable occasion, sir. Uh, may I trouble you to uh, step behind the tree with me for half a moment, sir? Suiting the action to the word, the sergeant led Bellew to the other side of the tree, and there, screened from view of the house, he, with a sudden, jerky movement, produced a very small leather case from his pocket, which he handed to Bellew. "'Not good enough for such a woman, I know, but the best I could afford, sir,' said the sergeant, appearing profoundly interested in the leaves overhead, while Bellew opened the very small box. "'Why, 
"'It's very handsome, Sergeant,' said Bellew, making the jewel sparkle in the sun. "'Anyone might be proud of such a ring.' "'Why, it did look pretty tidy, in the shop, sir, to me and Peter Day. My comrade has a sharp eye, and a sound judgment in most things, sir, and he took a deal of trouble in, in selecting it. But now, when it comes to giving it to her, why, it looks uncommon small and mean, sir. A ruby and two diamonds, and very fine stones, too, sergeant. So I made so bold as to uh, come here, sir, pursued the sergeant, still interested in the foliage above, half an hour before my usual time, uh, to ask you, sir, if you would so far oblige me as to hand it to her when I'm gone, sir. <laughs> Lord, no! said Bellew, smiling and shaking his head. Not on your life, sergeant. Why, man, it would lose half its value in her eyes if any other than you gave it to her. No, sergeant, you must hand it to her yourself, and, what's more, you must slip it upon her finger. Good Lord, sir! exclaimed the sergeant. I could never do that. <laughs> oh, yes, you could. Not unless you stood beside me, a force in reserve, as it were, sir. I'll do that willingly, sergeant. Then, perhaps, sir, you might happen to know which finger. The third finger of the left hand, I believe, sergeant. Here's Aunt Priscilla now, said Small Porges at this juncture. Lord, exclaimed the sergeant, and sixteen minutes afore her usual time. Yes, there was Miss Priscilla, her basket of sewing upon her arm, as gentle, as unruffled, as placid as usual. And yet it is probable that she divined something from their very attitudes, for there was a light in her eyes, and her cheeks seemed more delicately pink than was their wont. Thus, as she came toward them, under the ancient apple-trees, despite her stick and her white hair, she looked even younger and more girlish than ever. At least the sergeant seemed to think so, for, as he met her look, his face grew suddenly radiant, while a slow flush crept up under the tan of his cheek, and the solitary hand he held out to her trembled a little, for all its size and strength. "'Miss Priscilla, ma'am,' he said, and stopped. "'Miss Priscilla,' he began again, and paused once more. "'Why, sergeant,' she exclaimed, though it was a very soft little exclamation indeed, for her hand still rested in his, and so she could feel the quiver of the strong fingers. "'Why, sergeant!' "'Miss Priscilla,' said he, beginning all over again, but with no better success. "'Goodness me!' exclaimed Miss Priscilla. "'I do believe he is going to forget to inquire about the peaches.' "'Peaches!' repeated the sergeant. "'Yes, uh, Priscilla.' "'And why?' "'Cause he's brought you a ring,' Small Porges broke in. "'A very handsome ring, you know, Aunt Priscilla, all diamonds and jewels, and he wants you to please let him put it on your finger, if you don't mind.' "'And—' "'Here it is,' said the sergeant, and gave it into her hand. Miss Priscilla stood very silent, and very still, looking down at the glittering gems. Then, all at once, her eyes filled, and a slow wave of colour dyed her cheeks. "'Oh, sergeant,' she said very softly, "'oh, sergeant, I am only a poor old woman with a lame foot, and I am a poor old soldier.' with only one arm, Priscilla. You are the strongest and gentlest and bravest soldier in all the world, I think, she answered. And you, Priscilla, are the sweetest and most beautiful woman in the world, I know. And so I've loved you all these years, and never dared to tell you so because of my one arm. Why, then, said Miss Priscilla, smiling up at him through her tears, if you do— really think that oh why it's this finger sergeant so the sergeant very clumsily perhaps because he had but the one hand slipped the ring upon the finger in question and porges big and small turning to glance back as they went upon their way saw that he still held that small white hand pressed close to his lips end of chapter twenty one
two of the money moon this librivox recording is in the public domain the money moon a romance by geoffrey farnell chapter twenty two coming events cast their shadows before i suppose they'll be marrying each other one of these fine days said small porges as they crossed the meadow side by side yes i expect so shipmate nodded bellew and may they live long and die happy say i ay ay captain and amen returned small porges now as they went conversing of marriage and ships and the wonders and marvels of foreign lands they met with adam who stared up at the sky and muttered to himself and frowned and shook his head good afternoon mr bellew sir and master georgie well adam how are the hops hops sir there never was such ops, no, not in all Kent, sir, and I'm wishin' is that they was all safe picked and gathered. What do you make o' them clouds, sir, over there, just over the pint o' the oast house? Bellew turned and cast a comprehensive, sailor-like glance in the direction indicated. Rain, Adam, and wind, and plenty of it, said he. Ah, so I think, sir, driving storm and thrashing tempest. Well, Adam? "'Well, sir, perhaps you've never seen what driving rain and raging wind can do among the ops binds, sir. All I wish is that the ops was all safe picked and gathered, sir.' And Adam strode off with his eye still turned heavenward, and shaking his head like some great bird of ill omen. So the afternoon wore away to evening, and with evening came Anthea. But a very grave-eyed, troubled Anthea, who sat at the tea-table silent and preoccupied, in so much that small porges openly wondered while miss priscilla watched over her wistful and tender thus tea which was wont to be the merriest meal of the day was but the pale ghost of what it should have been despite small porges's flow of conversation when not impeded by bread and jam and bellew's tactful efforts now while he talked light-heartedly keeping carefully to generalities he noticed two things one was that Anthea made but a pretense at eating, and the second, that though she uttered a word now and then, yet her eyes persistently avoided his. Thus he, for one, was relieved when tea was over, and as he rose from the table, he determined, despite the unpropitious look of things, to end the suspense one way or another, and speak to Anthea just so soon as she should be alone but here again he was balked and disappointed for when small porges came to bid him good-night as usual he learned that auntie anthea had already gone to bed she says it's a headache said small porges but i specs it's the hops really you know the hops my porges she's worrying about them she's afraid of a storm like adam is and when she worries i worry oh uncle porges if only my prayers can bring the money moon soon you know very soon if they don't bring it in a day or two afraid i shall wake up one fine morning and find i've worried and worried myself into an old man never fear shipmate said bellew in his most nautical manner all's well that ends well a low and aloft all's a tonto so just take a turn at the lee braces and keep your weather eye lifting for you may be sure of this if the storm does come, it will bring the money moon with it. Thus, having bidden small Porges a cheery good night, Bella went out to walk among the roses. And as he walked, he watched the flying rack of clouds above his head, and listened to the wind that moaned in fitful gusts. Wherefore, having learned in his many travels to read and interpret such natural signs and omens, he shook his head and muttered to himself, even as Adam had done before him. Presently he wandered back into the house, and, filling his pipe, went to hold communion with his friend, the Cavalier. And thus it was, that having ensconced himself in the great elbow-chair, and raised his eyes to the picture, he espied a letter tucked into the frame thereof. Looking closer, he saw that it was directed to himself. He took it down, and, after a momentary hesitation, broke the seal, and read. 
Miss Devine presents her compliments to Mr. Bellew, and regrets to say that, owing to unforeseen circumstances, she begs that he will provide himself with other quarters at the expiration of the month, being the twenty-third instant. Bellew read the lines slowly, twice over, then, folding the note very carefully, put it into his pocket, and stood for a long time staring at nothing in particular. At length he lifted his head, and looked up into the smiling eyes of the cavalier above the mantel. "'Sir,' said he, very gravely, "'it would almost seem that you are in the right of it, that yours is the best method after all.' Then he knocked the ashes from his pipe, and went slowly and heavily upstairs to bed. It was a long time before he fell asleep, but he did so at last, for insomnia is a demon who rarely finds his way into Arcadia. But all at once he was awake again, broad awake and stirring into the dark, for a thousand voices seemed to be screaming in his ears, and eager hands were shaking and plucking at window and lattice. He started up, and then he knew that the storm was upon them at last, in all its fury, rain and a mighty wind, a howling, raging tempest, Yes, a great and mighty wind was abroad. It shrieked under the eaves, it boomed and bellowed in the chimneys, and roared away to carry destruction among the distant woods, while the rain beat hissing against the window-panes. Surely in all its many years the old house of Dapplemere had seldom borne the brunt of such a storm, so wild, so fierce, and pitiless. And lying there upon his bed, listening to the uproar and tumult, Bellew must needs think of her who had once said, We are placing all our hopes this year upon the hops. End of chapter 22《Twenty Three of the Money Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Money Moon, a Romance by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 23. How Small Porges, in his hour of need, was deserted by his uncle. Ruined, sir! Done for! Lord love me, they ain't worth the trouble of gathering. What's left on em, Mr. Bellew, sir? So bad as that, Adam? Bad! Ah, so bad as ever was, sir! said Adam, blinking suspiciously, and turning suddenly away. Has Miss Anthea seen? Does she know? Ah! She were out at dawn, and, oh, Lord, Mr. Bellew, sir, I can't never forget her poor stricken face, so pale and sad it were, but she never said nothing, only, oh, Adam, my poor hops, and I see her lips all of a quiver while she spoke, and so she turned away and came back to the house, sir. Poor lass, oh, poor lass, he exclaimed, his voice growing more husky. She's made a brave fight for it, sir, but it won't no use, you see. It'll be good-bye for her to Dapplemere, after all, that their mortgage can't never be paid now, no how. When is it due? Well, according to the bond, or the deed, or whatever they calls it, it be due to-night, at nine o'clock, sir, though old Grimes, as a special favour and utter much persuading, had agreed to hold over till next Saturday, on account of the op-picking. But now, seeing's as there ain't no ops to be picked, while he'll foreclose to-night, and glad enough to do it, you can lay your oath on that, Mr. Bellow, sir. To-night, said Bellow, to-night, and he stood for a while with bent head, as though lost in profound thought. Adam, said he suddenly, help me to harness the mare. I must drive over to the nearest railroad depot. Hurry, I must be off, the sooner the better. What? Be you goin', sir? Yes, hurry, man, hurry. Do you mean as you're a goin' to leave her, now, in the middle of all this trouble? Yes, Adam, I must go to London, on business. Now hurry, like a good fellow. And so together they entered the stable, and together they harnessed the mare, which done, staying not for breakfast, Bellew mounted the driver's seat, and, with Adam beside him, drove rapidly away. But small Porges had seen these preparations, and now came running all eagerness, but ere he could reach the yard, Bellew was out of earshot. So there stood small Porges, a desolate little figure, watching the rapid course of the dog-cart until it had vanished over the brow of the hill. And then, all at once, the tears welled up into his eyes, hot and scalding, 
and a great sob burst from him, for it seemed to him that his beloved Uncle Porges had failed him at the crucial moment, had left him solitary just when he needed him most. Thus small Porges gave way to his grief, hidden in the very darkest corner of the stable, whither he had retired lest any should observe his weakness, until, having once more gained command of himself, he wiped away his tears with his small and dingy pocket-handkerchief, he slowly recrossed the yard, and entering the house, went to look for his auntie Anthea. And after much search he found her, half lying, half kneeling beside his bed. When he spoke to her, though she answered him, she did not look up, and he knew that she was weeping. "'Don't, Auntie Anthea, don't,' he pleaded. "'I know Uncle Porges has gone away and left us, but you've got me, you know, and I shall be a man very soon before my time, I think. So oh, don't cry, though I'm awful sorry he's gone too, just when we needed him the most, you know.' "'Oh, Georgie,' she whispered, "'my dear brave little Georgie, we shall only have each other soon. They're going to take Dapplemere away from us, and everything we have in the world. Oh, Georgie!' "'Well, never mind,' said he, kneeling beside her, and drawing one small arm protectingly about her. "'We shall always have each other left, you know. Nobody shall ever take you away from me. And then there's the money moon. It's been an awful long time coming, but it may come to-night, or to-morrow night. He said it would be sure to come if the storm came, and so I'll find the fortune for you at last. I know I shall find it some day, of course, cause I've prayed and prayed for it so very hard. And he said my prayers went straight up to heaven, and didn't get blown away, or lost in the clouds. So don't cry, Auntie Anthea. Let's wait. Just a little longer, till the money moon comes. End of chapter 23of the money moon this librivox recording is in the public domain the money moon a romance by geoffrey farnell chapter fourteen in which shall be found mention of a certain black bag baxter sir get me a pen and ink yes sir now any ordinary mortal might have manifested just a little surprise to behold his master walk suddenly in, dusty and dishevelled of person, his habitual languor entirely laid aside, and to thus demand pen and ink forthwith. But then Baxter, though mortal, was the very cream of a gentleman's gentleman, and the acme of valets, as has been said, and comported himself accordingly. "'Baxter! Sir!' oblige me by getting this cashed yes sir bring half of it in gold sir said baxter glancing down at the slip of paper did you say half sir yes baxter i'd take it all in gold only that it would be rather awkward to drag around so bring half in gold and the rest in five pound notes very good sir and uh, baxter sir take a cab "'Certainly, sir.' And Baxter went out, closing the door behind him. Meanwhile Bellew busied himself in removing all traces of his journey, and was already bathed and shaved and dressed by the time Baxter returned. Now, gripped in his right hand, Baxter carried a black leather bag which jingled as he set it down upon the table. "'Got it?' inquired Bellew. "'I have, sir.' "'Good.' nodded Bellew. Now, just run around to the garage and fetch the new racing car, the Mercedes. Now, sir? Now, Baxter. Once more Baxter departed, and while he was gone, Bellew began to pack. That is to say, he bundled coats and trousers, shirts and boots into a portmanteau in a way that would have wrung Baxter's heart, could he have seen. Which done, Bellew opened the black bag, glanced inside, shut it again, and, lighting his pipe, stretched himself out upon an ottoman, and immediately became plunged in thought. So lost was he, indeed, that Baxter, upon his return, was necessitated to emit three distinct coughs, the most perfectly proper and gentlemanlike coughs in the world, ere Bellew was aware of his presence. "'Oh, that you, Baxter?' 
said he, sitting up, back so soon? The car is at the door, sir. Ah, the car? Uh, yes, to be sure. Baxter? Sir, what should you say if I told you? Bellew paused to strike a match, broke it, tried another, broke that, and finally put his pipe back into his pocket, very conscious the while of Baxter's steady, though perfectly respectful, regard. Baxter, said he again. Sir, said Baxter, what should you say if I told you that I was in love, at last, Baxter, head over ears, hopelessly, irretrievably? Say, sir? Why, I should say, indeed, sir. What should you say, pursued Bellew, staring thoughtfully down at the rug under his feet, if I told you that I am so very much in love that I am positively afraid to tell her so? I should say, very remarkable, sir. Bellew took out his pipe again, looked at it very much as if he had never seen such a thing before, and laid it down upon the mantelpiece. Baxter, said he, kindly understand that I am speaking to you as a uh, man to man, as my father's old and trusted servant, and my early boyhood's only friend. Sit down, John. Thank you, Master George, sir. I wish to confess to you, John, that her regarding the uh, haunting spectre of the might have been, you were entirely in the right. At that time I knew no more the meaning of the, er, uh, the word, John. Meaning the word love, Master George? Precisely. I knew no more about it than that table. But during these latter days I have begun to understand, and, er, uh, the fact of the matter is I am, I am fairly up against it, John. Here Baxter, who had been watching him with his quick, sharp eyes, nodded his head solemnly. "'Master George,' said he, speaking as your father's old servant, and your boyhood's friend, "'I'm afraid you are.' Bellow took a turn up and down the room, and then, pausing in front of Baxter, who had risen also as a matter of course, he suddenly laid his two hands upon his valet's shoulders. "'Baxter,' said he, You'll remember that after my mother died, my father was always too busy piling up his millions to give much time or thought to me, and I should have been a very lonely small boy if it hadn't been for you, John Baxter. I was often up against it in those days, John, and you were always ready to help and advise me. But now, well, from the look of things, I'm rather afraid that I must stay up against it, that the game is lost already, John. But whichever way fate decides, win or lose, I'm glad, yes, very glad to have learned the true meaning of the word, John. Master George, sir, there was a poet once, Tennyson, I think, who said, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And I know that he was right. Many years ago, before you were born, Master George, I loved— and lost, and that is how I know. But I hope that fortune will be kinder to you, indeed I do. Thank you, John, though I don't see why she should be. And Bellew stood staring down at the rug again, till aroused by Baxter's cough. Pray, sir, what are your orders? The car is waiting downstairs. Orders? Why, er, uh, pack your grip, Baxter. I shall take you with me, this time, into Arcadia, Baxter. For how long, sir? Probably a week. Very good, sir. It is now half-past three. I must be back in Dapplemere at eight. Take your time. I'll go down to look at the machine. Just lock the place up, and uh, don't forget the black bag. Some ten minutes later the great racing car set out on its journey, with Bellow at the wheel, and Baxter beside him, with the black bag held firmly upon his knee. Their process was, necessarily, slow at first, on account of the crowded thoroughfares. But every now and then the long, low car would shoot forward through some gap in the traffic, grazing the hubs of bus-wheels, dodging hansoms, shaving sudden corners in an apparently reckless manner. But Baxter, with his hand always upon the black leather bag, sat calm and unruffled, 
since he knew by long experience that Bellew's eye was quick and true, and his hand firm and sure upon the wheel. Over Westminster Bridge, and along the old Kent Road they sped, now fast, now slow, threading a tortuous and difficult way amid the myriad vehicles, and so betimes they reached Blackheath. And now the powerful machine hummed over that ancient road that had aforetime shaken to the tread of stalwart Roman legionnaires, up Shooter's Hill and down, and so into the open country. And ever as they went they talked, and not as master and servant, but as between man and man. Wherefore Baxter the valet became merged and lost in Baxter the human, the honest John of the old days a grey-haired, kindly-eyed, middle-aged cosmopolitan who listened to and looked at young Alcides beside him as if he had indeed been the Master George of years ago. So you see, John, if all things do go well with me, we should probably take a trip to the Mediterranean. In the uh, Sylvia, of course, Master George? Yes, uh, though uh, I've decided to change the name, John. Ah! "'Very natural, under the circumstances, Master George,' said Honest John, his eyes twinkling slyly as he spoke. "'Now, if I might suggest a new name, it would be hard to find a more original one than the haunting spectre of the—' "'Bosh, John! There never was such a thing. You were quite right, as I said before, and—by heaven! Potato sacks! "'Eh, what? Potato sacks, Master George?' They had been climbing a long, winding ascent, but now, having reached the top of the hill, they overtook a great, lumbering market-cart, or wain, piled high with sacks of potatoes, and driven by an extremely surly-faced man in a smock-frock. "'Hallo there!' cried Bellew, slowing up. "'How much for one of your potato sacks?' "'Get out now!' growled the surly-faced man, in a tone as surly as his look. "'Can't you see that they're all occupied?' "'Well, empty one. Get out now!' repeated the man, scowling blacker than ever. "'I'll give you a sovereign for one.' "'Now don't you try to come none of your jokes with me, young feller,' growled the carter. "'Sovereign! Bah! Show us!' "'Here it is,' said Bellew, holding up the coin in question. "'Catch!' And with the word he tossed it up to the carter, who caught it very dexterously, looked at it, bit it, rubbed it on his sleeve, rang it upon the footboard of his wagon, bit it again, and finally pocketed it. "'It's a go, sir,' he nodded, his scowl vanishing as if by magic, and as he spoke he turned, seized the nearest sack, and forthwith set a cascade of potatoes rolling and bounding all over the road. Which done, he folded up the sack, and handed it down to Bellew, who thrust it under the seat, nodded, and, throwing in the clutch, set off down the road. But long after the car had hummed itself out of sight, and the dust of its going had subsided, the carter sat staring after it, open-mouthed. If Baxter wondered at this purchase, he said nothing. Only he bent his gaze thoughtfully upon the black leather bag that he held upon his knee. On they sped between fragrant hedges, under whispering trees, past lonely cottages and farmhouses, past gate and field and wood until the sun grew low. At last Bellew stopped the automobile at a place where a narrow lane or cart-track branched off from the high road and wound away between great trees. "'I leave you here,' said he, as he sprang from the car. "'This is Dapplemere. The farmhouse lies over the upland yonder, though you can't see it because of the trees.' "'Is it far, Master George?' "'About half a mile. Here is the bag, sir, but—' "'Do you think it is quite safe?' "'Safe, John?' "'Under the circumstances, Master George, I think it would be advisable to—to uh, to take this with you.' And he held out a small revolver. Bellew laughed and shook his head. "'Such things aren't necessary here in Arcadia, John. Besides, I have my stick. So good-bye for the present. You'll stay at the King's Head, remember.' "'Good night, Master George, sir, good night, and good fortune go with you.' "'Thank you,' said Bellew, and reached out his hand. "'I think we'll shake on that, John.' So they clasped hands, and Bellew turned and set off along the grassy lane. And presently, as he went, 
he heard the hum of the car grow rapidly fainter and fainter until it was lost in the quiet of the evening. End of chapter 24